So one thing that may have become clear in the in the previous parts is that the brain seems to differentiate somewhat between gains and losses. And that's uh, a question we're going to ask in a number of studies in the next uh, um, part of the, of the video lectures. So a very uh, famous paper that was... Um, that started this this question. So how are gains encoded versus losses encoded? Is this one shown here by Sabrina Tom and Russ Poldrek and colleagues, which was published in Science in 2007. And what the authors did is they presented these um, lotteries to participants in the scanner and the lotteries offer some, some gain amount and some loss amount. And these were shown for three seconds and subjects then chose whether to uh, accept the lottery, which means they had a 50-50 chance of gaining this amount or losing this amount. Um, and if they rejected the lottery, then there would be no change to their status quo, which was maybe, uh, which was an endowment of, of some amount. Um, the interesting thing here of, in this experimental design is that they went through a number of potential losses ranging from minus 5 euros to minus 20 euros and a number of potential gains from 10 to 40 euros. Um, and this allowed the researchers to orthogonalize the potential gains to the potential losses. So this means that if you go through all of these trials, every single cell in this, in this matrix here, you end up with um, an amount of losses, so minus 20, that is, let's say, let's, let's stick to this one here, that is uh, paired with all the potential gains. And similarly, every gain is paired with every potential loss, which basically leads to um, these two variables, potential gain and potential loss, to be independent. When you look at the uh, behavior, uh, so the probability of acceptance, you can see that high gain, low loss trials are almost always accepted, and low gain and high loss trials, so 10, 10, uh, plus 10 minus 20, are always never accepted. So there's sort of a loss aversion parameter that emerges from this heat map here. Um, response times are not so important, so let's skip this part here. But then when you, when you look at this at the level of the brain, you can then take these two independent variables and enter them into your imaging model as, so at the time that the subject is making the decision, how are gains encoded and how are losses encoded. So you have a regressor for gains that, that basically reflects the magnitude of each gain, and that's shown on the right side in the red colors. And you have a... Um, regressor that reflects the amount of losses and that's shown on the left side here and you can see that both of these are encoded in the same regions on average so we have a little bit more stuff going on in the brain um, more regions being recruited within the brain when losses are encoded relative to when gains are encoded but generally this occurs in the same region such as this region here is the ventral striatum similar to this region here and we have some lateral prefrontal activation that's shown here. Um, here it's more um, dorsal lateral prefrontal, whereas here we have some ventral lateral prefrontal. But in general, you can see there's quite a bit of overlap between how gains and losses are encoded. And that is actually one of the conclusions from this paper that there seems to be similar regions encoding gains and losses, at least in this task. You can go a little bit further with this and you can show that um, there is sort of a, in, in each of these regions, the striatum and the VMPFC, there is sort of a heat map that also seems to encode um, something that's very similar to the behavior with, with largest responses to high gain and low loss uh, trials or, or lotteries and then relatively lower responses um, to high loss, low gain uh, type lotteries when they're presented and this occurs both both in these regions it's a bit noisier than the behavior is but it matches the behavior quite well so there seems to be a neural loss aversion parameter emerging uh, from this or at least this is what this heat map is suggesting and you can go even a step further and look at this region here the ventral striatum and then correlate behavior loss aversion which is lambda uh, this is the um prospect theory loss aversion parameter uh, and correlate that with neural loss aversion which is the um, activation intensity of uh, of this region during gains relative to during losses and then you see that this correlates quite highly here
Now you have to be a bit careful with such low numbers of participants and an outlier here. This is probably an overestimation, but this has been replicated a number of times now. So it's, it's likely not a false positive. Now we have done a study to look at how this generalizes from the domain of money to the domain of uh, to, to a negative domain, namely the domain of shocks. So we, we used the same task where participants were deciding between a sure thing, which was 10 shocks on a given trial, versus a lottery, which gave, gave the opportunity of, in this case, eight less shocks, versus two more shocks at a 50-50 chance. So, so we are now purely in the domain of, of loss here again, right? So there was no positive outcome in this, but a relatively more positive outcome versus a relatively worse outcome. Subjects then chose this and received fee feedback via the simulation here, uh, where, they, where they either then received eight less or two more shocks, and that was then administered in the end. Um, and what we see that during the decision period, when, when participants are making this decision here, um, we see the same um, activation difference that uh, Tom et al. found in, in a very similar region, namely the ventral striatum here, indicating that um, there's an increased activation in the striatum uh, with the amount of shocks less and a decrease reflecting uh, more shock amounts. So better in the red and worse in the blue bar. So even in the domain um, of, of pure losses or, or a, a negative uh, domain, basically, um, or the domain of punishment, however you want to call this, the um, striatum still encodes wh whether something is relatively better or relatively worse. And what this study therefore uh, f provides further evidence for is the, this relative value coding in the brain, uh, much like in the Tremblay and Schultz paper discussed earlier. And we show this here. Um, this also occurs in the um, ventral striatum. Now let's move on to a different methodology um, that can actually, uh, relative to functional magnetic resonance imaging, provide us with more detailed accounts of how specific neuron types might respond under uh, different contexts. And this was um, a, a very innovative study looking at neurons in the ventral tegmental area and a little bit below uh, in the substantia nigra and comparing the responsiveness of these neurons to rewards relative to punishments in a way. Uh, in a way. So we have a positive outcome associated with each of these stimuli, but at different levels of probability. So 100% reward here, 50% reward here, and 0% reward here. So that's the unconditioned stimulus associated with these different types of stimuli uh, for the monkey who's sitting basically again in this chair and receiving then uh, juice rewards here. In another um, version of the task, these stimuli here, are associated with air puffs to the eye, which leads to a blinking response. And that's obviously not something that's um, positive, but is more in the domain of, of mildly aversive. Um, if we look at the behavior of these monkeys, we see exactly what's predicted. Uh, we can see that as the reward probability increases, the number of, of licking, or what they call licking magnitude, increases. So the monkey expects more and therefore licks more vigorously on the on the little spout that, that is in his uh, cage. Now, on the negative side of things, as the air puff probability increases, so as we go from, from the blue square to the yellow uh, circle here, the number of blinking responses increase across two monkeys. And this each one of these uh, increases is significant. So behaviorally, we, we get what we expect. Now let's have a look at how neurons respond to these different stimuli. And you can see that um, we get what we expect. So across the board, we see larger responses to more predictive cues. Uh, and this is sort of an intermediately large response when this cue is shown. Uh, here you see again the action potentials and the average of the action potentials shown down here. And then a dip in responsiveness when this cue comes on um, because no reward is expected here. Similarly, for air puffs, this is negative. So, so here we see an increase as the probability of the reward 
gets higher. And here we see um, an increase as the probability of reward gets lower. So that's, that's a negative uh, encoding. So we, we see increased responsiveness uh, in, in the same types of neurons, dopamine neurons, um, for, for positive outcomes and decreased responsiveness for negative outcomes. So 100% air puff is negative, has uh, lower responsiveness here, comparable to 0% reward, whereas 0% air puff is the absence of something negative, and that's indicated by an increased uh, neural response. And you can look at the average responsiveness here of these neurons. If you look at the thick uh, red curve, that's the 100% reward condition compared to the dark blue curve, that's the 0% air puff condition. Um, you see that there is a, a positive encoding of, um, of rewards and sort of a negative encoding of uh, punishments. And those neurons are found largely in VTA, and that's basically what would be predicted from, the, from studies, for instance, on the reward prediction error. Good things increase the firing rate of dopamine neurons. Bad things decrease the firing rate of dopamine neurons. Uh, but there were also different types of, um, of neurons in this region or in the vicinity of this region. And those showed an increased responsiveness uh, to both rewards shown here. So increase here, increase here to the rewards, but also an increase to the air puffs, so the negative outcomes. And uh, you can see this again in the curves here, increased responsiveness here to rewards, but also increased responsiveness here to the 100% air puff uh, situation. Um, and you can see that these curves here now overlap, whereas they were at different slopes, one negative, one positive. In one case, now they both have positive slopes, indicating these are reward non-selective dopamine neurons. So this is showing that uh, having different methods like electrophysiology in this case, can give us more information about uh, different types of neurons. Um, and in this case, now complicates the picture a little bit. So we have some neurons that are more excitatory in some sense, encoding both the presence of rewards and punishments, and other neurons that are excitatory and inhibitory, encoding the presence of rewards, but not that of punishments, or negatively so that of punishments.